today. We're so, so happy you're with us. If you're joining us online, welcome wherever you are. Let's stand, let's worship Jesus and celebrate victory in Jesus today. Come on, sing this out. From beginning to end, you are faithful. From beginning to end, you're unchanging. From beginning to end, you are always good. From beginning to end, you are God. From beginning to end, you are always good. From beginning to end, you are God. me 
hands empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love sing it out no there's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, I know that it's true I'm not afraid And I'm not afraid To show you my weakness All my failures My failures and flaws Lord, you see in the morning And you still call me
joining us here for your first time so we just want to say thank you hey city life let's show our first time guests some love let's give them a warm welcome it's awesome man 
lives. Yeah, man. You know, here at City Life, we exist to lead the one far from God to pursue full life in Christ. So giving you a greeting this way and just seeing so many families here today, I mean, it fills our heart because this is why we started the church. So thank you guys for being here with us. Absolutely. And we hope that when you came today, you felt like you were coming home in the very best sense of the word. Um, we are one house with many rooms. And so we are worshiping here in South Philly today. And at the same time, there is a City Life location in Southwest Philly that is having Easter services and an egg hunt. And so many of you are joining us online, even all around the world. And so we want to say happy Easter to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And so I encourage all of you, if you feel comfortable, scan the QR code on the screen or click on the link in the video description. We would love to just follow up with you on your visit today. Awesome, guys. And if you're a first time guest with us, please make sure you stop by the welcome desk on your way out. We have a free gift for you to honor you just for being here with us today. And also, we want to invite you to an amazing opportunity coming up in a few weeks, which is our welcome lunch. And it's good because you guys get to come and get a free lunch, and we get to spend some more time with you. So you can sign up online, and I hope to see your face in the place. Let's get there. Come Absolutely. on. Absolutely. That's a win for everybody. We have one of my very favorite Easter traditions Which one? for all of you today, and that is free family photos. Come on. Um, we have all of our family photos in our dining room. I'm excited to add this year to the mix and so I encourage you stop by today you'll just head straight out these doors through the lobby and when you're on the patio outside make a right to the Thrive Student Ministry Room we have a professional photographer there because you guys look fantastic Come on. so you should definitely capture that today with a great family photo I love that word free I just do <laughs> but see, see like I, I just want to take a moment right now to thank you for your radical generosity and giving uh, it's because of your giving that we have been able to do some amazing outreach. I mean, we had a couple uh, Easter egg hunts throughout the community. And also, we had the opportunity to support over 50 missionaries worldwide that are celebrating Easter today because of your faithfulness and giving. So thank you guys for that so much. I just want to let you know, if, if you're new to City Life, please feel no obligation or pressure to give at all. But if you're part of the City Life family, um, and you would love to give today, we have different ways. You can give in the boxes that's in the back. You can give online, you can give on our app, and you can go old school and send it in the mail. That's right, snail mail is still happening. It still works. Hey guys, we speak a blessing over you right now, and I ask that you please check out this special video that we have for you, and get ready for an amazing message. This is the Sunday from Pastor Brad. Woo. God bless you guys. Happy Easter, everybody, and welcome to our church this weekend. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Brad. I have the privilege of leading City Life, and I'm so glad you're here today. Welcome to everybody joining us online. I want to kick off the message today with an interesting question. Who is the most, just the pushiest salesperson you've ever met? Pushiest salesperson, where, where does your mind go back to? Maybe it's a telemarketer you couldn't get af off the phone, or maybe it was a timeshare presentation you just innocently signed up for on vacation. 
trying to get free tickets to Disney World till you realized you were trapped in the lower bowels of hell and that not even Mickey Mouse was worth that kind of torture. We probably had some experiences. My mind goes back to the first house that I bought. I was a bachelor. I was single, living in Michigan. I bought this really small bungalow. It was a great little starter house, you know, to get going in life. And I was getting ready to leave one day. I was putting my shoes on, about to walk out the door, and the doorbell rang. And so I went and I answered the door, and there was a young man standing on the porch. He was about my age. He had a big box with him, and he said, hey, do you have a few minutes? I said, honestly, man, I'm sorry. I don't. I'm on the way out the door right now. Maybe you could come back another time. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. It's only going to take a few minutes. And I said, really? No, I'm serious. Like, I don't have time right now uh, to talk. And, and he, we just continued back and forth like that for a few minutes. I could not get this guy to leave. And so finally, I thought, I don't know what else to do. I started gently trying to close the door. And that's when he just went for it. He stuck his foot in my door and barged right into my living room. And the next thing I knew, I was standing there in disbelief. This guy was unpacking the most complicated vacuum cleaner I had ever seen in my life in the middle of my tiny little living room. And he just began to go on. Man, I got to tell you, this vacuum cleaner, it's going to change your life. You've never seen anything like it. He is dumping out dirt. He's making a mess. He's cleaning it up. I'm trying to figure out, how do I get this guy out of my house? Like, I have to... I have to leave. Finally, I said, brother, how much does this vacuum cleaner cost? And once I realized that I was going to have to sell my car (laughs) to buy the vacuum cleaner, I lost it. I'm not proud to tell you. I forgot that I was a pastor. I forgot for a minute that I was even a Christian. And I unloaded on this guy. I said, listen, bro, you don't understand. Are you blind? Do you want me to give you a tour through my house? I don't even have any carpet. (laughs) And I get it on an Easter like this. That might be how some of you feel. Maybe you're not really a religious person. Maybe you grew up around church, but it didn't really click or connect for you. And you're here today because your grandmother said you got to be in the family picture. And it could be that to you, I feel a little bit like a door-to-door salesman bursting into your life, trying to sell you something that you don't even think you need. I get it. And I promise you, I'm not coming to your house later today to stick my foot in the door. But since we're all here together, I wonder if we might contemplate this question for a few moments. What if you need Easter more than you think? Because there are a lot of stories available to us today that are attempting to explain the human experience, but I think that the Easter story is a better story. I want to tell you that story today. It begins in a garden, and I want to take you back to that garden. We're going to read from John's Gospel. This is all the eyewitness account of the disciple John. He was there, and this is what he records for us, beginning in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So we find here in verse 1 the basic contours of our story. Mary Magdalene, early on Sunday morning, this is just a few days after the crucifixion of Jesus on Friday, shows up and she finds an empty tomb. We know that she wasn't by herself. If you cross-reference this account with the parallel passage in Luke chapter 24, she had come with some other women and they were there with spices to anoint Jesus' body, and to grieve. The setting is a garden. In fact, I want to show you a picture of the garden tomb. This is in Jerusalem. Hundreds of thousands of people have visited the garden tomb to reflect on the resurrection of Jesus. We don't know for certain that this is exactly where Jesus was buried, but it would have looked something like this. So Mary shows up in the garden. She finds that the tomb is empty. And so this is her response in verse 2. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. 
So these are some precious historical details. And the reality is that you have to explain the empty tomb. And skeptics of the resurrection often will uh, pose this theory that Jesus' body was stolen. But it needs to be said that if the groups that had the means to pull that off, neither the Jewish uh, leaders or the Roman authorities had anything to gain by Jesus' body going missing. In fact, they had everything to lose because all they had to do to stop the movement of Christianity in its tracks was produce the body of Jesus. All they had to do was say, here's his body, and none of us are here today. And yet they couldn't do that, and there's this interesting detail. Peter goes in, and he finds Jesus' grave clothes actually folded up and lying there neatly. What thief do you know of that takes the time to to make the bed before sneaking away with the body? It didn't happen. Jesus' body wasn't stolen. It was risen. Verse 8 says, Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then they had still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. So this is Peter and John. And now that they see the tomb is empty, they decide to go back home and figure out what to do next. They're going to regroup. And that leaves now Mary Magdalene there at the tomb by herself. And I want to look at the rest of the story from her perspective beginning in verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. So Mary Magdalene, who had been the first one to get there, is now there alone. It's been a very chaotic morning. She does not know what to make out of all of this. She's weeping. She's crying. And as we look at her story, I want to make three observations about the empty tomb moments of our lives. And the first one, I'll call it this, hollow expectations. Have you ever stood on the beach with your toes in the sand, feeling the water as the tide comes in and goes back out. I love that feeling, but it reminds me of our hopes and our expectations for the future in life, because I think that there are things we're looking forward to in the future as if we're waiting for the tide to come in. Maybe it is a promotion, maybe it's, you know, a hot date that you've got coming up, or a graduation, or a retirement, but we look at these things and we think, man, once that event happens, I am going to feel so much better. Life is going to be so much easier. My mental health is finally going to start to improve. I'm going to be so much happier. And so we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And it comes and it has gone so fast, isn't it? The party's over. And just as it's touching our feet, it's like we're watching it go away. And if you've ever experienced this, that, you know, the date's over and she's not the one. The promotion now that you had been waiting for is in the past, but you still feel like something's missing. And it turns out that those expectations were as hollow as that chocolate Easter bunny you're going to eat later today. And I wonder if that's what Mary was feeling here at the tomb. So we continue reading in verse 12. It says, she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. It's a really important question. Why are you crying? This might be a good time to tell you a little bit more of Mary's backstory. Mary Magdalene, or Mary from Magdala, which was a small village in Galilee, is mentioned 12 times in the Gospels. The most salient fact about her life probably comes from Mark 16, verse 9, where we learn that Jesus delivered her from seven demons. So when Mary Magdalene met Jesus, she was helpless, she was hopeless, she was utterly dominated by darkness. She was likely self-destructive, she was likely homeless, but when she met Jesus, Jesus changed her life. Jesus set her free. All of a sudden, she wanted to live and not die. And the demonic self-hatred was replaced with pure and holy love. And for the first time in years, she looked at her reflection and recognized someone looking back at her who had value and purpose. And once she changed, Jesus changed her life, it leads to the second thing we know about her. 
she decided to commit her life to Jesus. And Mary became, John 8 tells us, a part of a small group of women who traveled with Jesus and his disciples and helped fund their ministry. You know, a lot of people think that Jesus just traveled around with 12 dudes all the time and that was it. But if you think about it, it's common sense. Because everybody knows 12 guys are not going to travel everywhere and take care of themselves. (laughs) And all the women said, amen. (laughs) And so Mary traveled with Jesus and she decided, this guy changed my life. I'm going to give my future to him. And so his teaching, this movement is going to be my future. This is what my life is going to be about. And she began to follow him from village to village. She followed him for three years. She was ready to follow him for the rest of her life until she followed him to the cross. That's the third thing we know about her. John 19 says that she was there at the cross. As Jesus hung from the cross, as the nails were hammered, into her, into his body. Mary stood there for six hours, helpless, in horror, as Jesus was gasping for air, being tortured on the cross. And then we know that Mary followed him all the way to the tomb. Matthew 27 tells us that she was there at the tomb when they put his body in the tomb and they sealed it with the stone. Mary saw it all. And I wonder Have you ever watched a dream die? Maybe for you, it was the dream of being a mother. And you waited and you prayed and finally you were celebrating a pregnancy only to lose your child in a miscarriage. Or maybe for you, it was the dream of a degree and a career and you went back to school and you got halfway through, but you had to drop out with a bunch of debt and nothing tangible to show for it. Maybe it was a marriage or a ministry or a business or something that started full of hope and promise, but it ended painfully early. Or maybe for you, it was literally like Mary standing at a grave, burying somebody that you thought was going to be a big part of your future. Mary, why are you crying? She was crying because of what could have been. She was weeping over what in her mind should have been. Mary, why are you crying? Her response is telling, because they've taken the body of my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. You know where disappointment comes from in our lives? It comes from our false assumptions about the future. That's where it comes from. And I think there are two reasons that we experience disappointment. One is that we don't get what we're hoping for in life. I had hoped she was going to be the one I had hoped to make the team. I had hoped to get it published. I had hoped to be in a house by now. That's the language of disappointment. But another reason that we experience disappointment in life is because we do get what we want, and it turns out to be hollow. You ever experienced that? In fact, I want to cross-reference this account in John 20 with the parallel passage for a minute in Luke 24. When Mary and the other women showed up at the tomb... At the beginning of the day on Sunday, the angels were there and they asked them a question that Luke records. And I want you to see it in verse 5. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who's alive? Great question. Why are you looking for life in a graveyard? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? But that's what we do, isn't it? We look for precious things like significance and intimacy and hope and connection and significance. We're looking for it from fragile things like bosses and jobs and spouses and girlfriends and boyfriends and degrees. And what happens is that the expectations turn up empty and can't live up to the hype. My uh, kids love YouTube and they love watching YouTube and they've got some YouTubers that that are their favorite. And they've got one that actually like to watch myself. His name's Ryan Trahan. Uh, This guy's really creative. He's really fun. A lot of you know Ryan Trahan. I know that because he's got 15 million subscribers. And so some of them got to be in this room. He's got 3 billion views on his YouTube videos. And he's probably best known for traveling across the country on a single penny. And so I was getting to know this guy a little bit more. And I saw an interview 
that he had with another YouTuber. And in this interview, he was telling the story about how he met his wife, her name is Haley, and the impact that she had on his life. They got married four years ago when he was 21 years old. But when he met her, uh, it was interesting. He tells the story because she was a committed Christian and he was a highly cynical atheist. He just couldn't get his mind around how any thinking person could believe in the historic claims of Christianity. But as he would kind of grill his girlfriend about Christianity, he was really surprised because her responses made sense. And at the same time, his heart was beginning to yearn for an answer. And ultimately, all of it converged on the 4th of July. They were watching fireworks together about four years ago. And this was at a time when his YouTube channel was blown up. He had more money than he knew what to do with. He was getting everything that he thought he wanted in life. Yet he was sitting there watching the fireworks with Haley, and instead of celebrating, he started to cry. And she was surprised, and she asked him, Ryan, why are you crying? And he realized in that moment, it's because I have everything I thought I wanted, but I don't feel anything. And in the interview, this is how he describes the realization that he had. Quote, this was my finish line. All of my identity is in this, and I feel nothing. And after that experience, he decided to go on a spiritual journey. And he began to pray. And he began to seriously study the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. And ultimately decided to surrender his life to Jesus. He became a follower of Jesus. And today he gives the credit and the praise to Jesus for the good vibes and the passion that comes through his video that millions of people enjoy. He says, it's all from the source of Jesus in my life. But this is the gift, listen of the hollow expectations, is that God walks through the front door of unmet expectations to meet us in our disappointment. The question is, will you recognize him? That's the second movement in this story. I want to call it hidden explanations. God, why in the world did I end up here? God, I thought this marriage was your plan. God, I thought you gave me that job that is no longer my job. You see, when your heart is stung by the reality of unmet expectations, explanations are hard to come by. And here's Mary. She's weeping. And let's pick up the story there in verse 14. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus but she didn't recognize him. When your soul is stung with disappointment, it's very difficult to recognize the activity and purpose of God in the middle of the unexpected, unchosen, undesired circumstances of your life. But here's what I've learned about disappointment. God is there often hiding in plain sight. It could be that he is the king disguised as a baby in a manger. It could be that he is the creator of the universe disguised as a humble carpenter. It could be that he is the savior hanging out at leper colonies and at parties with tax collectors and prostitutes because when Jesus comes to meet you in your unmet expectations, he's just getting started. He's ready to shatter your expectations. Verse 15, here's what he asks her. Dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Now, this part's hilarious to me. She doesn't recognize him initially. Jesus' body has been glorified. It's his resurrected body. And she's crying, and she doesn't know at first who it is. And so she makes the best assumption she can based on her surroundings. I'm in a garden. This guy's probably the gardener. And so... She thinks that, and this is where the story really, to me, drips with irony, because Jesus actually does have some pretty ancient and extensive experience with gardening. And I want to flash back about 2,000 years from this moment to the very first garden that God ever planted. And so here's what Genesis chapter 2 at the beginning of the Bible says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made, the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he 
placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this is God's first garden. He clears the ground. He plants this stunning garden. He calls it Eden. He puts, his, he puts Adam there. He puts Eve there. And he tells them, I want to give you life. And he puts this tree in the middle of, gar- of the garden, the tree of life. And he says, you can eat it. You can eat of any of the trees in the garden. They will all give you life. Just don't touch this one tree. It's, it's poisonous. It's toxic. You will not find life there. Yet Adam and Eve make a decision that foreshadowed so many decisions to come. A decision that all of us made, and they decided to look for the living among the dead. And they decided that we're going to find life apart from the source of life, that we're going to find life without God. They decided that God actually was standing in their way. And so in their rebellion and in their pride, they went and began to say, God, we're going to find life without you. And if I could really define sin, because this, it's in this ancient garden that sin comes into the world. And really, one of the simplest ways you could define sin is this, that sin is trying to live the life God gave you without God. Sin is trying to get out of life what God promised you without God. And let me just tell you, it didn't work for Adam It didn't work for Eve, it hasn't worked for me, and it's not going to work for you. Because there's only one place to find life, and that's from the tree of life. It's from the source and the giver of life himself. As a result of their sin, Adam and Eve found themselves removed from the garden. Now I want you to imagine the disappointment that they must have felt. They knew what it was like to have perfect and intimate fellowship with God without any shame, without any guilt, without any pain, without any sickness, without any death. Now all of that has been lost. Adam, why are you crying? Eve, why are you weeping? Because sin has taken our garden and we don't know how to get back. 2,000 years later, on the evening before Mary would weep at the foot of the cross, Jesus knelt in another garden, a garden called Gethsemane. And it was in that garden that Jesus would experience the ultimate bout of disappointment, a disappointment greater than any other human being has ever experienced because Jesus, who for eternity had been one with the Father, could feel the Father's presence slipping away. And he found himself disoriented. Father, if it's possible, there's got to be another way. I've obeyed you. I've loved you. Why have you forsaken me? I don't understand this. And can I tell you today, life is confusing even when you're the Son of God. Not even Jesus got every prayer answered the way he hoped. But in that garden, Jesus reversed the curse of sin. Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, but Jesus redeemed the garden. And because Jesus came and knelt in the garden and bled in the garden and prayed in the garden and surrendered in the garden and obeyed in the garden, he now comes to us as the great gardener when we're standing in front of empty tombs, nursing empty expectations, he's ready to plant some seeds of hope in the painfully softened soil of our hearts. I've got a little illustration up here. And so I am going to actually try out my gardening skills this Easter. And so you're welcome. This might be bad because I have the gift of killing plants. Some of you have the gift of giving them life. Uh, Not my gift, but if you were going to plant some tulips, we're coming into the spring. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, tulips are beautiful. And so I've got up here some tulip bulbs. These are tulip seeds. And the first thing you're going to do if you're going to plant some tulips, you need some base soil, some potting soil. And so I've got that over here. And you're going to put that in your pot. Because then you're going to take the tulip bulb, the tulip seed, you're going to put it in the soil. And I want you to think about this experience from the perspective of the seed. Here is the seed. You're planted in the soil, 
But what's going to come next is that you are just going to get buried. And we are going to bury this cute little seed under all of this potting soil. And then I've got over here on this side some fertilizer. And you know what fertilizer is, right? Literally, crap. It's the first time I've used that word in an Easter sermon. There's a first for everything. This is literally worm poop. And you're going to take the fertilizer, and now you are going to bury that cute little seed under a big load of crap. And I wonder if you have ever felt like that seed. I, from what I understand, it takes about 16 weeks for a tulip bulb to develop under the surface of the earth, buried, before it's ready to burst through the soil, beautiful to the eye. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way. God, seriously, you're just going to leave me down here, buried, without any sunlight, all winter long, hidden, overwhelmed. How much crap can one heart take? And if you're that seed, there's only really one option that you have at this point in the process, and that is to wait. To wait for the rain, to wait for the seasons to change, to wait for the sun to come out, to wait for the bloom. That's it. And that may be the most uh, courageous, reproducible thing that Mary does in this story. It's so simple, you almost miss it. And that is that she just shows up. She's just there in pain, weeping, yet waiting on God. And it's there in the hopeful, painful waiting that Mary discovered what was actually happening buried in the tomb all along. And that's the third observation I want to make. Let's call it heaven's exclamation. She thinks Jesus is the gardener. Now Jesus is about to come out of hiding. Verse 15, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. This is so beautiful to me because it's so personal, it's so intimate. The minute that Jesus calls her by name, her eyes are opened to recognize his resurrection glory. And I believe today that Jesus wants to do something so personal in your life. He wants to call you by name. And though you may feel hidden, I want to tell you that you have never been unseen by him. And though you may feel disappointed, you need to know that your future is precious to him. And though you may, be feel, you may feel dumped on, you need to know that nothing is ever wasted by him. And he is inviting you and he's inviting us to trade the disappointment of our empty expectations for the hope of an empty grave. And this is where we see the twist in the story because what I need you to know is that Jesus is not only the gardener, he's also the seed. He became the literal seed, just the fetus within his mother's womb. But then at the age of 33, he was killed and he descended into, our, into darkness and he was buried in the heart of the earth. But something happened after he was buried underneath all of our filth and our shame and our sin. He broke through in resurrection power. And so now the seed is the gardener who can plant fresh hope in your weary soul and bring you back to life. And today, even if all the faith you can muster feels like a tiny little seed. God can work with that if you plant it in him. And can I just tell you, now that Jesus has been raised from the dead, he's working on a new garden. He's brought a new kingdom into the world. He planted it like a seed 2,000 years ago, and it's been growing beneath the soil ever since. It's his kingdom, and it's a kingdom of healing, and it's a kingdom of life, and a kingdom of hope. And although today we still get sick, and we still grieve death, and we still feel the sting of disappointment, there's coming a day when the seed of 
his kingdom. It's going to shoot through the soil of history as a new heaven and a new earth. And scripture tells us that there will be a new garden in the middle of that city. And in the middle of that garden will be a tree of life. And for eternity, because of the resurrection of Jesus, he will wipe every tear away from our eyes. And every disappointment will be a distant memory as we live out our eternal days in the glorious garden of God. Verse 17, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father. And here he says it, as far as I can tell, for the first time in the Gospels. And your Father. To my God and your God. Mary, you got to let me go. Because I'm about to surprise you again. I'm not here just to give you back your big brother. I'm here to give you your heavenly Father. And so go and find the disciples and tell them that I'm alive. Go and tell them that I'm making all things new. Go and tell them that hope survived. Go and tell them that our story isn't over. Go and tell them that sin doesn't get the final word. Go and tell them that death has lost its sting. Go and tell them that the reason you didn't expect this is because no eye has seen and no ear has heard what your Father has in store for those who love Him. So our story ends. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And here's Mary standing in the same garden where she experienced her deepest disappointment, now experiencing her ultimate destiny to become the first evangelist in the history of the world to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You remember our little seed buried overwhelmed, hidden. This is what God had in mind all along. So God, we thank you for hope. We thank you for life. I thank you that although we have bypassed the tree of life time and time again, in our pride and in our sin, that you've redeemed the garden and that you have purchased for us redemption. May we experience it again today in Jesus' name. Amen. With your eyes closed, just for a few more moments, I want to give you an opportunity today to put your faith in Jesus. He's the source of life. There's nowhere else to go. This is why Easter matters more than you think because you can drink from so many other wells. You're just gonna get thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. Jesus is here to quench your thirst once and for all, to fill you from the inside out. So in a minute, I'm gonna lead us in a prayer of surrender I'm going to lead us in a prayer of just putting our faith in Jesus. And if today you recognize Easter Sunday 2024, that your life's not right with God, that you're drinking from the wrong wells, running to the wrong tree, I want to give you an opportunity. We're going to go back to the garden to make a better decision. Say, today I'm I'm running to the tree of life. I'm not going to trust my own instincts anymore. I'm going to run to the one who died and rose again. So if you want to be included in that prayer in just a moment, you want to surrender your life to Jesus, put your faith in him today, I want to simply ask you to raise your hand right now wherever you are, in the balcony, here on the main floor. Just raise it. We'll wait a few minutes and just hold it up high. You can keep it up just for a moment. If you're watching online, to raise your hand right now. God is moving in this place. He's inviting you to come to himself. He's calling you by name. And so I want to lead you in a prayer. We're all going to pray the prayer together, but if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, just pray it together with us. I'm going to help you with the words. Pray this out loud. Jesus, I believe that you rose up out of that grave 
you died in my place. Thank you. You conquered my sin. Now I put my faith in you. I surrender to you. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Fill me with power, with purpose and hope. Fill me with your spirit. I want to follow you and serve you and know you. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's thank Jesus for who he is. What he's doing right now. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me from your heart, I want to invite you to take one more just really practical step. We're going to put a phone number up on the screen. And please don't skip this because that seed that's buried in the ground, that seed is your faith right now. We want to water it so that it grows. And so here's what I would love for you to do. Just pull out your phone, open up your text messaging app, and just type in the word life. That's it. And send it to that number that's on the screen. And we'll send you some links to some videos we created just to help you take some next steps spiritually to start watering that seed, to begin to, to, to see that new hope God's planting in you grow, bear fruit. And so I hope that you'll do that today. Just pull out your phone. We'll leave it up there for a minute. You can do that right now. And what we're going to do together here in the remaining moments of our service is just take some time to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus in the garden of God. And I want to transport you to the garden of God. You could go back to the one where Jesus revealed himself for the first time to be alive. Or maybe you want to fast forward in your mind for a few minutes to the glorious garden of God that will be there in heaven, the tree of life restored to us again. But just before we sing our final song, I want to invite you to close your eyes and we're going to have a few moments of reflection. And I want to take you to the garden and I want you just to reflect for a moment on the resurrection of Jesus. He's alive. What does that mean for you? where the 
And you can take it home with you. And I would encourage you maybe later today, early this week, you can open it up. And inside there are some instructions and there's a little packet of basil seeds. And I would love for you, just as a next step with this message, you can plant the basil seeds right into this planter. And as you do to just declare, I'm planting a seed of faith going into the next, this next season of my life, that the story isn't over, that God's just getting started and let your hope grow even as you watch the basil grow. And so our gift to you, you can take that and please get your family picture as well. Thank you for joining us for Easter. Now may the love of the Father and the grace of Jesus and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Happy Easter, everybody.